Awesome. Well, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in to the uh, first actual interview for Pigskin Economics. Uh, so really, uh, really spreading our wings here, branching out. And I'm excited to welcome uh, Malcolm Lemons to be our very first guest. Uh, Malcolm, you can explain it a lot better than I can, but uh, started as a college basketball player, uh, turned pro, and now he's really leading the way when it comes to covering the intersection between sports and Web3. And so I don't know how much of our audience is super familiar with Web3, uh, but it's, it's super, uh, super exciting stuff, something I'm particularly interested in. And so I'm personally super excited to, to hear more about your experience and what you're doing. So uh, before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and plug your stuff. Uh, make sure to follow him on social media at Malcolm Lemons, as well his, as his uh, newsletter at uh, The Hype XYZ. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Awesome. Then I'll make sure to plug those in the show description as well. But <clears throat> Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead and kick it to you. Go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you, how you got started. And um, yeah, excited to hear it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I didn't know I was a, the first guest, so I appreciate Very that. Yeah. Man. I'm honored. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man, uh, started off just like a lot of other athletes growing up, had this dream of wanting to become a professional athlete. And that's really what I chased throughout high school. Uh, played in a highly competitive um, Catholic school league in the Washington, D.C. area. Played against a lot of pros. Um, then had the opportunity to go play in college after that at Niagara University. So I did that for about three years, um, had a lot of ups and downs, which ultimately led me to transfer in my last year of college to a school out in California called Cal State San Marcos and finished up playing out there. And then, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to have the opportunity to go play overseas. So uh, went went over to Japan. I just kept going west and went to Japan for a couple of years and, and kind of lived out that dream of be, being a professional athlete. Um, but in the back of my mind, I knew that wasn't going to last forever. Right. And so um, I kind of, you know, during my time overseas, started to get into to writing and creating content more as a means of just like therapy and trying to figure myself out. Um, and because I had so much time on my hands and subsequently, that kind of led me to publishing my first book when I came back home. And that was really like the transition to my uh, to life after sports for me. Um, and it really kind of jump started what I started to do next and my next passion, which was like the business of sports and helping athletes kind of leverage their platforms and create uh, monetization opportunities and prepare for that transition. Um, and so I, for a number of years, that's what I was doing, man. I, I uh, started different companies um, in the sports business space and uh, different projects, podcasts, things of that nature, just kind of figure everything out. Um, and then, you know, during the pandemic, you know, having a lot of time on my hands again, you know, as so much of us did, uh, fell down the Web3 rabbit hole and um, had always had this interest in like innovation and technology. Um, and, and I thought here was this revolutionary technology and, and blockchain uh, can can really kind of have an impact on so many industries. And so just started to do a deep dive and fell down the rabbit hole and, and kind of wanted to find my space in the industry. And so. Uh, initially, as I was having you know conversations with people who were building in the space, one of the biggest challenges was um, how do we onboard more people into the Web3 space? How do we hire talent? And so I had this brilliant idea to start a recruiting agency, even though I had no experience doing this such, uh, such a thing. Um, and did that for about nine months, man, and got burnt out completely uh, and kind of took a step back and, and analyzed, well, how can I merge my interest in sports, my background in sports and this new wave of, of blockchain technology. And so that kind of led me to uh, doing more research. And I didn't see a lot of people talking about that intersection, even though it was very niche. Um, I felt sports um, had such a strong use case when it came to blockchain. And, and that was really like the birth of the hype report. Um, it was me, so, me more so just figuring out how I can help people who work in the sports space understand where the future of uh, Web3 kind of plays a part in that um, and how block, blockchain technology can really impact the sports world as we know it. And so uh, that was really the impetus, man. And it's really um, kind of just growing this weekly newsletter and helping people um, stay up to date with everything that's happening in the space and providing a lot of my perspective on, on, on where I see the industry going in the next several years. So I'm super excited about the space. I think, as I said before, has a lot of upside and, and just uh, want to be at the forefront of this movement. Cool. No, that's that's quite the journey, man. No, that was that's, that's super cool. Um, I guess before we get into the deep stuff, do you have any just like super crazy stories about working in, and playing in Japan or just like something that, you know, a normal American casual viewer would never would never know about that league? Um, I'll, I'll speak on my experience specifically. Um, so I actually 
I had a teammate who got sent home, who got his contract ended uh, uh, prematurely because he was talking in practice. So I'll say one thing about playing overseas. It's a totally different ball game than playing professionally um, in the States because there are a lot of different stipulations and rules and things that uh, they try to get around when it comes to contractual obligations. So mm-hmm. it can be a very finicky business and very unstable. And that was part of the reason why I kind of wanted to to put the ball down uh, just because it's, it could be so unstable. So I've heard a lot of different stories, but that was probably the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was like he was talking in practice one day, the next week he was on a plane going back home. And I was like, well, I better keep my mouth closed when we yeah. practice because I don't want that happening to me. So it's crazy, man. This is it's a lot of stuff that goes on overseas. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I'd rather run some suicides or something. But right. Each their own. Um, and that, that's, that's awesome, man. So I guess like how long ago has been uh, she started the hype report? Uh, so it's been about six months now. So uh, October of uh, 2022. Cool. Awesome. <clears throat> so then I guess going back to you as a player and kind of having covered the space for a while now, how do you think that Web3 could have impacted your own playing career? Uh, this is a great question. Um, I think it, there is still the space is still figuring itself out. You know, I think during the pandemic and even, you know, up until like uh, – kind of coming out of it in like the end of 2022, we saw this this hype train, no pun intended, of like NFTs being sold for millions of dollars and so much conversation of like, um, you know, not, not really understanding the value or the utility behind what NFTs can be and things of that nature. And so there was kind of this uh, this push to, to just, you know, booster up something that really didn't have any substance there. And I saw, so I think the conversation around what Web3 is right now is, is kind of formulating in the, in the space is really trying to figure itself out for what it can be long term. I think when it comes to like college athletes and, and even think about my experience, uh, you know, playing in college, it was a totally different ball game, obviously, and then what it is now with NIL. Um, but I think when athletes start to think about how they can utilize like things such as NFTs to build their brand, you you kind of have to look at it from the perspective of like, how can I engage my fan base or my audience and, and provide them with uh, a vehicle to deepen the connection that I have with them? So I think a lot of how people are looking at Web3 and what it is today is about uh, how can we drive revenue? How can we create more monetization opportunities where I think the conversation be, should be geared more towards how can we utilize this technology to to build a deeper connection with the people who love us the most? And so I think that's how teams, leagues and even athletes need to be looking at, um, you know, the, the the landscape as a whole when it comes to like the metaverse or tokenomics or DAOs and things of that nature that which incorporates blockchains. It's more about the engagement piece and, and building community and, and uh, really a relationship with the people that follow you and, and, and really are invested in who you are as a person. Yeah, no, that, that definitely makes sense. That's that's a super cool perspective. That's I'd say one of the things that has drawn me personally to the Web3 space, it is that that community aspect and, and how empowering that can be. Um, have you seen this kind of adoption of technology take off in the college ranks so far, or is it still pretty early stage? It's still very early. I think some programs have started to explore um, what they can do with uh, with NFT specifically, and even like in virtual settings and things of that nature. I mean, two universities that come to mind are like Clemson and BYU. I know BYU launched some initiative where they had a, a, a platform specifically for like um, uh, NFT holders to purchase certain like memorabilia and collectibles and things of that nature of their players and stuff like that. So I think uh, universities and programs will try to figure this thing out and they're testing. We're, we're now in kind of this phase where everybody's experimenting and seeing what they can do and um, kind of how they can uh, increase that engagement with their fans or seeing what their their fan base even once when it comes to uh, this technology, but we're still a long way off b- b- before it becomes like mainstream or like people really understand even what a wallet, a digital wallet is and things of that nature. So there, there's still this big learning curve that that we have to kind of get over before we start to see it widespread across like universities and athletes utilizing blockchain and things of that nature. Yeah, and, and kind of speaking off that, that topic, this is a pretty complex technology. And do you think that there is that technological barrier both to athletes and, and figuring out how to actually launch these NFTs and stuff of their own? But also, I mean, looking at just kind of the broad demographic of sports fans, a lot of them tend to not be the same people that are, you know, aping into NFTs and stuff like that. So do you think there is sort of that technological barrier to wider adoption? 
I think partially, I think more so is the language that we use. Uh, um, a lot of the language that people who have been in the space for a while or le even looking from like a high level perspective, it, it can be somewhat of a barrier to entry because things such as like non fungible tokens can be intimidating or, uh, you know, understanding uh, cryptology and things of that nature. So a lot of the terms that we use decentralize autonomous organization, that's a very intimidating concept for for your average person to understand or to even want to uh learn more about so we have to reshape and reframe the things the way we're communicating blockchain as a whole and how we're onboarding more people into the space so when i'm having conversations with different companies and founders who are trying to build it's a lot about like well how are you positioning your product in a, in a way that somebody who's used to a web two, two world cannot even realize they're they're uh being onboarded into web three so mm -hmm. incorporating things such as like, um, you know, instead of like them having to set up a wallet, maybe they can use a credit card or just their email address to log into whatever platform, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to utilize. But on the back end, it has this blockchain or Web3 capability. So a lot of it, a lot of it is the language and the way that we're um, helping users onboard into the space without it being so cumbersome and technological, ch technologically challenging for the someone to use your product or your service. So um, it's more about that than it is like we need people to understand the technology. It's not about that. It's about how we're communicating it and more so how are we getting people to, um, how are we onboarding people into the space to where they're not even understanding, they're not even realizing that they're using Web3. Yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. I think it's kind of honestly a, a wider problem than just in the sports realm too. I mean, even yeah. being someone that's following the space, you're saying some of these, you know, decentralized autonomous organizations that I kind of I kind of cringed up a little bit even, right. even understanding and, and knowing what that is and so yeah that that definitely makes sense um I guess kind of transitioning a little bit more towards just broader NIL how do you think that that has impacted the game so far uh when it comes to web3 or just NIL in terms of just college athletes I guess just just college athletes in, in general um I mean, to be completely honest with you, uh, I have uh, I did a lot of work in that space uh, when I was kind of transitioning out of basketball initially. And like a lot of what I talked about was like helping athletes build their brands and, and monetize and how do they leverage that in life after sports. And so I've kind of got away from that a little bit and I haven't had my hand too much on the pulse recently. But from what I've seen and the things that I have been following, I think NIL has been um, super beneficial, not only for the athletes, but you look at like the the social impact, like athletes using partnering with brands that have a you know uh, uh, a charitable um, aspect tied to it and giving back to the community and things of that nature, or even athletes using brand partnerships to help uh, their other teammates who might not have the same following or opportunities, um, helping them you know uh, you know get brand uh, uh, exposure with like brand opportunity or or like products or things of that nature. So I think from a standpoint of like how athletes are positioning the the partnerships and the brand and the, and the um opportunities that they get to help other people from that perspective is it seems like it's been very uh good from that angle so i think nil overall is still have, has a long way to go in terms of just like removing bad actors from the space and even putting some more um regulation around it i think that's important to just um make sure that the space in the, in the, in the, this, this kind of new rule is, is being up, uh, up, upheld accordingly. Um, but I think from what we've seen and, and as it kind of matriculates over time and figures itself out, just like the web three space, um, I think we'll, in hindsight, we'll, we'll, you know, see NILs being beneficial for our parties involved. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. And I completely understand even someone that follows it as closely as I do. It seems like it's changing every day. So it's, yeah. So most people compare it to the Wild West, which is a bit of a cliche at this point. Um, I think people are saying the same thing about the Web3 space. I mean, it's, it's uh, certainly an exciting time, but it's, it's also confusing. And so um, I guess tying that back in with, with Web3, how do you think that kind of the combination of the two is, is empowering the next generation of athletes? Yeah, so I think kind of going back to what I said before, as far as like athletes can utilize this technology, not only to build their brand, but um, to help other parties, other people. Um, so for example, like an athlete starting an NFT collection where they tie utilities such as like a meet and greet and people who purchase the NFT 
um, you know, that, that the the funds can be funneled into uh, to go to the athlete's favorite charity or things of that nature. And then when those things are resold because of blockchain technology, like whenever it's resold, um, you know, those royalties can go back to the to the charitable organization in perpetuity. So like things like that, I think, are great examples of how athletes can utilize different capabilities within Web3 to not only have a social impact, but to build a deeper relationship with their fan base and to connect with the people who are going to follow them during their careers and even afterwards. So uh, a lot of it is just about thinking outside of the box, box and then partnering with people who can align with that vision um, and, who, and building a team around you that, you know, kind of can uh, help you, you know, you know, build these projects and do these different things. So it's really up to the athlete in, in terms of just how they, uh, you know, want to build that, 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 their brands and, and the opportunities that they want to take advantage of. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. That's, that's super cool. Do you have any, I mean, I've seen personally, mostly just like trading cards and things like that. Um, kind of the, the most experimental projects that athletes have used so far, but do you have any particular favorite case studies, maybe your favorite companies that you've seen kind of emerge to help address this market? Uh, when it comes to NFT specifically, or I guess just utilizing Web3 and, and kind of bringing that into the NIL game. Um, not specifically when it comes to NIL. I think uh, one thing uh, that has kind of intrigued me or something I, to keep, I think people should kind of keep their eye on is like merging digital and physical items, especially within the sports space. So like even when it comes to like collectibles, like physical cars and digital cars merging together or like, uh, for example, like Nike, what Nike did with Artifact in that partnership mm -hmm. or how they bought that company to merge like where you have like the physical shoe drops and then tying an NFT to it or like a digital asset to it. I think merging those two things is going to be super uh, interesting when it comes to the sports landscape, just because collectibles within sports and even like the sneaker culture and pop culture as a whole, how that kind of ties into the industry, um, I think is really intriguing, has a really strong use case. Um, but I think just collectibles across the board is is super interesting uh, when it comes to sports. Uh, but nothing I can think of off the top of my head when it comes to NIL specifically. Yeah, no, I mean that was that was a super interesting um, example, though. I think there is a lot of potential there for, um, yeah, like you said, like the, for the collectible space. And I guess it kind of brings me to my next question, which is just like going forward, what are what are some of the innovative or, or um, projects that you think have the most potential or, or have yet to be explored, but you think will be? Um, so I think uh, looking at, I think the metaverse has a lot of uh, use cases, especially like how brands have started to explore that with like within the World Cup, there was a lot of different activations with like Roblox and Visa and Budweiser. They did a lot of different things, kind of just experimenting during the World Cup and the feedback mm -hmm. was really great. And so looking at the trends and how the metaverse and digital and virtual experiences are trending upward. Um, I think, I think when it comes to that, especially uh, within sports and having um, fans engage uh, in a virtual setting, that has a lot of potential. And I think that industry is going to be huge in the next five to 10 years. So I'm really intrigued by the metaverse as well and how um, companies are creating those virtual experiences for fans, whether it's like, um, access to like the locker room if you like purchase a certain nft or um being able to connect with their favorite players virtually and things of that nature so the metaverse is something that i'm kind of keeping my eye on as well but i think um other than that it's just going back to like like i said with nfts i think digital assets when you look at it what what it can provide across the board everything from like ticketing to um you know just having exclusive access um to rewards and loyalty like there's so many different things that teams and leagues are doing and i think we'll do in the future when it comes to just um utilizing nfts to create deeper connections with their fans and, and yeah. the audience cool awesome that that sounds that sounds super exciting and i'm personally excited uh to, to really see that stuff actually take place do you uh you, I, i'm guessing you did see the uh nba app where you could like put your face whatever on the player it's like how long you think for you can go. You can go and put your face on Caleb Williams and get him to score a touchdown. Yeah, man, that that was pretty <laughs> crazy. Um, so I I think that uh the only thing I I have a I have a, a issue with that is like it, it's cool, but it's like what what's the use? Like what's the problem? Yeah, problem are we solving here? You know, it's it's like a cool feature, but 
it, it, it's it's one of those things like, well, is people really going to use this? Is, is, is it going to be one of those things like they use it once and it's like, oh, that was kind of cool. And then they, you know, never do it yeah. again. So I think we have to kind of take a step back. Well, every every everybody who's building in the space or who is trying to implement these different technologies to understand, like, well, what what problem are we solving for our audience or for our consumer and how are they going to utilize this in their daily lives? So. Um, I think that feature was awesome, though. I mean, even just the display and how they, how Adam Silver kind of, uh, you know, presented that was cool. Yeah, he's he's turning into Tim Cook on us. So. <laughs> for, for real. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I guess in in your opinion, like, what is the end game for Web three and in athlete engagement? Like, in once this space has reached maturity, like, what do you think that looks like to you? And also, what do you think the timeline on that would be? Well, that, those are two really good questions. Um, in a perfect world, I think every every team will be issuing NFTs um, along with like a physical ticket, uh, and and within that NFTs for ticketing, you will be able to uh, provide you one. The team will have more data and information on every consumer, so they'll be able to create like customized, personalized experiences for them. But on the the user consumer end, you know, you can have access to different um, you know exclusive opportunities, to meet and greets, to uh, reward points, to loyalty, like anything you name it. Like that whole kind of. Uh, street like that would be streamlined and more efficient for both sides of the equation but i think when it comes to athletes and their fans um i think athletes will be doing the same like utilizing this technology um to build deeper connections to um you know whatever the case may be to to you know raise funds for their favorite charity or um you know create experiences for their closest fans and really kind of deepen the connection which will also help them have opportunities in life after sports so to me blockchain is is a way of just doing business more efficiently and providing um uh, a streamlined way we can build communities we can connect and engage with one another and so i think that in a perfect world that is um how i see the industry going that's what i hope it, it'll be in the next several years. And, and as far as like the timeline, um, it's really hard to say right now, because I think um, with anything, with any type of innovation, it, it does take time. And, and we, you know, we saw with FTX, like there's going to be situations like that, where we have to weed out the bad actors, we have to weed out the people who are not in this, and trying to make this space uh, better for the next, you know, 10 to 20 years, whatever the case may be. And so I, I've always kind of, I came into it with a long-term perspective. I'll, I'll always be super bullish on it because I see the potential. Um, there are going to be skeptics, but it's about the people who are building the foundation every single day and just putting in the work to make sure that um, the space is, is what it can be in the next, you know, whatever, you know, the time period, however long it takes. So um, 10 plus years, man, I'm, I'm putting, I'm putting that stamp on it. It's not yeah. a, it's not an overnight game. This is something that's going to take a while to reach mass adoption. But I think as long as we're pushing the, the, the needle forward and, and really just, um, educating people and, and going about things the right way, then it, it'll, you know, become what it's supposed to become. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've convinced me, I think I'm taking the under on the 10 years. So uh, <laughs> I hope, I hope, man. <laughs> That'd be nice, man. Yeah. So I, mean, I guess I guess I get you out on this one. And if there are any athletes watching this right now, what advice do you have to them for, for navigating this space and really maximizing the potential of Web3 and, and building their brand? The biggest thing is to just do your research, man. Due diligence is everything. Like I spent six plus months just reading, man, following people on Twitter, diving into white papers, uh, reading articles and just learning. Like the biggest thing is like you got to know what you're getting into before you get into it. And that's just not applicable to Web3. That's everything across the board. Like mm -hmm. people are going to say like, oh, don't invest in crypto. But like, have you done your research on, you know, the different coins out there and things of that nature? But it's the same thing with like the stock market and things of that nature. Like you have to know what you're getting into before you get into it. And so I tell everyone who's who wants to learn about Web3 or who um, wants to get into the space is like, do your due diligence before you do anything, because you you're, you're going to make mistakes either way. Um, but you can mitigate those mistakes by having the knowledge that you need to have, um, you know, beforehand. So, um, 
read, research, follow people who are building in the space and who are talking about it. And, um, you know, it, it'll take you where you need to go. Cool. Awesome. No, that sounds good. I think, uh, I think I know of a newsletter that covers the intersection of sports and, and web three, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, what, what was the name of that one again? The Hype Report, man. The Hype Report. Yeah, make, make sure you go and check that out. We bring you guys the good stuff there. And uh, make sure you follow him on social media, uh, Twitter, and and uh, his personal account and, and the Hype Report account. Go ahead and give us those handles one more time. So uh, you can follow me at Malcolm Lemons on every social media platform. I'm pretty active, uh, probably the most on LinkedIn, uh, but pretty active on Twitter as well. Um, and then the hype report is at the hype X, Y, Z on every social media platform. And then uh, the hype report dot X, Y, Z uh, is the newsletter. Awesome. And I'll make sure to put those in the description as well. Uh, is there anything else that you want to plug before we go? Yeah, man, I appreciate the opportunity. This was great. Absolutely. No, I, I learned a ton. So I'm, I'm excited and, and hopeful that our, that our listeners and audience will too. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and for everyone else, make sure you go and, Follow him on social media. Follow us on social media here at Pigskin Economics. Uh, username Pigskin Econ E C O N. Uh, this is great, and excited to, uh, to put this out there and, and get everyone's feedback. If you guys uh, like this, we can we can keep doing more. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll get you back on here in a few months to talk about how the space is evolving. So I uh, really appreciate your time. Absolutely, man. Anytime. Awesome.